sure uh, a week or so ago, you would have seen the older website, but this is the new one. So what's a little confusing about this course is that it's designed to be what we call in academia outward facing. And what I mean by that is anyone can access this course and pretty much all the material on the course. That's why this is a public website here. If you think about it, it's maybe a little disconcerting. What's up on Canvas is kind of behind a paywall, right? You have to be enrolled in the class to do it. You have to be paying money. I think this sort of information absolutely should be made available to the public. Anyone interested should be able to you know, look at this information. You can't get credit for taking a course by just reading the website, but it's important to have it out there and also important because you know faculty across the, uh, the world share this kind of information. And the last time I took this website down temporarily to do some changes, literally that morning, I got an email, a panic email from a graduate student in Ireland who was using this material, uh, wondered when it would go back up. So it is publicly facing. And actually, if you use the URL Ecocriticism 101, you will get directed to this site too. It will redirect to my main website and all. So anyhow, course overview, just to make sure that this is what you would want to do. So by the way, just technical thing, um, you see there I am and here I am as well. So why am I doing this? Well, all of these lectures are going to get uploaded um, two places. One is to GauchoCast, which is where all the documentaries stream from, and I'll show you that in a few minutes, but also to YouTube as well. And the reason for that is a lot of people look at this material online. So with the three courses I do, English 22, 23, 24, in the last couple of years, we've had over a million visitors to the YouTube channel, of course, websites and all. So why I'm recording this here is so that it can get uploaded there. But also you see what's happening here, which is live closed captioning. And that's important for a range of reasons. One, um, everything about this website and everything about the courses I do, I try to make them as fully accessible as possible. So um, it doesn't matter for, in fact, if you have you know, hearing, poor hearing or cannot hear at all if you're deaf, you can still take this course without a problem. And it also creates a transcript of the actual lecture. Sure. You're going to find that both in GaucoCast, if you asked for captioning, or if you're familiar with YouTube, how YouTube works, you go ahead and um, hit transcript in YouTube and you'll see it. So if you miss a lecture, not only will you have the lecture notes, which I'll be showing you, you have an actual physical transcript of everything that I said all along. And, and there's a third reason why, and it's a uh, it's a frustrating reason why I do the closed captioning. And that is, it will start happening about next week, probably, that people will start emailing me saying, people next to me are talking, I'm trouble, having trouble hearing you, and is there anything you can do? In the past, we've tried things in these large courses, like having a TA going around and taking names and deducting points and all. Um, I hope we don't have to do it again, but if you are having trouble with people talking next to you, then you get a pretty good transcript here of what I'm actually saying. It's also the case, uh, on a more pleasant note, that there have been many studies, last I checked over 100, that have suggested that if you read something while you're hearing it, your retention increases, sort of accessing two parts of your brain at the same time. So that's why this is up here. When it actually gets uploaded to YouTube, you uh, probably won't see that captioning here. But as you know, YouTube automatically does its own class captioning, which in some sense is better, not because of accuracy, it's probably about the same, but YouTube then translates into over 80 different languages. So if you, you know, this, if you're, you know, English is not your first language and this is all happening pretty quickly and now I speak quickly, well, go back, look at it, look at it on YouTube, turn on the closed captioning, set it for a language that uh, works better for you. And actually there have been studies that that will help you too insofar as if you are, you know, reading it in a familiar language and hearing it in one that you, you're learning, um, it can be really useful. So that's what that's about. Anyhow, um, if you do have uh, questions, remember to put them in that Q&A and I will glasses ready to read this, um, but so far no one has popped in. 
Okay, what's the course about? It's a sweeping survey of Western literature and culture from an environmental perspective. And I wanna talk about that by, in just that opening sentence, I don't mean to suggest that this is a privileging of Western culture, that the reason that we're doing this because this is the greatest culture in the world and all the other cultures don't matter. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, and in fact, we're gonna talk about that. It's gonna be a central issue for the class. And one thing to think about is, the culture that we have across the planet today has been profoundly influenced by Western culture. And that has erased other cultures or, or pushed them to the side through the colonial project, which has been going on for, for actually, in some cases, thousands of years. So we're gonna talk about that, but I just wanna be clear from the very beginning, that's not saying that this is the best um, culture. In fact, in lecture one, which is next week, we'll be talking about that. So you may be familiar, second paragraph here with like feminist critics, what they do, they're looking at literary representations of gender and women. What we're doing here is called ecological literary criticism, contract it to eco-criticism, that's why it's eco-criticism 101, and we explore how the relationship to nature or the planet is imagined. And, and nature and the planet are different, and we'll be talking about that. And just as I say here, as with changing perceptions of gender, literary representations change over time and change from culture to culture. And they actually play a significant role in generating those cultures and the practices that they do. So if you want to understand why we think about the environment the way that we do, why we think about you know, climate, why we do make the decisions that we do, well, the fact is going back and looking at the long history of this will give you insights into that. Why do we feel, for example, that it's perfectly fine to, you know, to completely deforest the Alberta area where the tar sands are, that amazing boreal forest in the uh, northern part of this continent? Why is that okay? Well, believe it or not, the first text we look at, the Epic of Gilgamesh, 5,000 years old, lays out a rationale for why deforestation is okay and gives basically the same reason that the um, Alberta uh, tar sands are being deforested now. So the main idea is to get a view of the long history of these issues. You might think that it happens with someone like Thoreau or Wordsworth, but these issues go way back. Deforestation will be first up for us, but things like air pollution, endangered species, wetland loss, animal rights, consumerism, they've all been appearing for a long time. And what we have that emerged in the 20th um, has a long history. I mean, most of the damage, to be honest, happened in the 20th century. But that's not reason to, to not think about what led up to it. And what I mean by that, in case you didn't know, since 1945, um, there's an era that's began, not called the Anthropocene, but we call it the Great Acceleration sometimes. And from a point of view of climate, 85% of all greenhouse gas emissions put into the atmosphere on this planet were put there since 1945. So you might think that that's where all the action is the last 70 years. But understanding why we did that, what set the stage for it. Um, I think that's really important. So we'll, let, we'll spend time with that. Um, we start with the Epic of Gilgamesh. Also to be clear, um, this is an English course. So we look at text um, a great deal, but we're also going to be looking at philosophy, theology, art history, architecture, um, the environment and media studies. So it's sort of a broad sweeping thing. This is me, uh, Professor Ken Dittler, just call me Ken, a um, little bit about me, so there. Um, but what you need to know is your contact person for this class. It's based on your last name. Your last name begins with A to L. Your TA is Dina. Dina, where are you? Dina, could you, Dina's in the back waving to everyone. So uh, everyone with A to L, you can turn around to see Dina. Um, if your last name begins with M to Z, your TA is Meet. Meet is in the back also, right next to Dina. So these are your primary contacts. So as I said, um, if you're emailing, as I say here, if you're emailing someone, don't email me, because that might actually be frustrating because I don't always get to emails very quickly. TAs are gonna be far more responsive. But as I note here, if you really want a quick response, post it to that Q&A that I showed you in Canvas. It's like the second thing at the top of our Canvas page. And that 
is, is the quickest way to get answers. And you may not have to post anything because let's say you had a question about what's the, when is the final exam gonna be? Is it gonna be the last day of class or is it gonna be during exam week? Well, as you know, someone already asked that question. If you go down through it, there, there will be as the course goes on, lots of different questions that people had. The other person that you have to know is the third TA, which is Aisha. And Aisha is right here. Aisha is sort of the uh, person behind all the, the tech here. And Aisha is not the person to go to to answer any questions about like the course material, about the readings or anything like that. But I, I talk about what Aisha does here. And that is things like the iClicker, Canvas, the grade book on Canvas, Gautocast, which is uh, integrated into Canvas. And we'll talk about that in a little bit because the documentaries for the course stream from there. If you have DSP accommodations, Aisha takes care of that and any sort of technical issues. Ah. And so, and recall that you know you have the email addresses for all three of the course TAs, and there are just three here. And um, I'll get to it in a minute, but just to let you know, there, there are no sections here, there are no discussion sections. We'll talk about how that happens. But one thing, and this is such an important point, it's not an online course. Um, all the course material is online, but I note here you have to attend the lectures, which are this period of time, Tuesdays, Thursdays, from 11 to 12, 15 at Campbell Hall. This will be a source of great frustration for many people. I know this because I get emails regarding it all the time. And the questions that people ask me in the email is, okay, all the course material is up there. You're recording all your lectures. The lectures are up there, and I'll show you. The lecture notes are up there. You can watch every documentary there. Everything is online. Why do we have to come to class? Well, first off, um, it's kind of a basic answer. You're taking a course, you should come to class. Um, but beyond that, there is a very specific administrative issue here. UCSB is an accredited university. This is an accredited course. In practical terms, you know that it's a course that has four credits. It is an accredited course as an in-person course. It is not accredited as an online course. You may know there are whole universities out there that are totally online now. You may know that there are other universities that have been transitioning to online for, for a long time. I was um, visiting professor at Princeton for a year, 10 years ago, and they were already making the transition online. For better or worse, UCSB has largely been committed to remaining brick and mortar university. That means its accreditation is based on people showing up in class. And the executive vice chancellor, who's the person overseeing all this for UCSB has made very clear that if you put course material up and a student can do the entire class without coming to class, that's a problem for our accreditation. How do we solve that problem? Well, it's very easy. We have an eye clicker. ICLICKER will check your attendance here. And I'll go over the ICLICKER in a minute. But you have to come to class, and I can tell you right now, over 1% of your course grade is for every class that you attend. So if you miss a class, you take, might as well take your 100% and drop it to 99, a little more than 99, actually. So I know you may be frustrated with that, because you know why should you attend? It's not really necessary. But there's really nothing I can do about it. It's an administrative you know, um, decision. Um, beyond me. Um, I And I note here, so please don't come and ask me, I am not in a position to give anyone, uh, you know, a special exception. There are medical exceptions. And I note here, this, if it uh, is you, you can click this open and look at that. Um, there are people who, who, for whatever reason, if they are Know, immunocompromised and shouldn't be in a room this large, um, that can be done. But I can't do that. It's not in my ability to do it. So I give you instructions on how to do it. If you miss a class for any particular reason, especially, you know, COVID's on its way back, uh, if you have a positive COVID test and you're quarantining or something, just contact your TA. That will be either Dina or me regarding that. Uh, no discussion sections. Um, all the course materials either delivered through live lectures, little pre-recorded lectures, and I'll show you those in a minute, the readings and the course films. Um, and there's going to be online discussion insofar as you're going to be making online YouTube comments. Um, if you were curious, I teach actually three courses interrelated, English 22, 23, 24. 
22 is obviously in the fall, 23, which is an introduction. Well, here, I'll click it open here so you can see that. Introduction to Literature and the Environment, that's our class. 23 is the Time of Crisis Part 1, 24 is the Time of Crisis Part 2. If you complete all three of these, and last year we had 85 people who did, you get the TA Barron Certificate in Environmental Leadership. And I, um, I talk about this here, and this was made possible through the generosity of T.A. Barron, an author who gave UCSB a half a million dollars. So, um, yeah. So if you're curious why I'm teaching these courses, well, there. Um, navigating the website tells you a little thing, like there's a little chevron here that scrolls back to the top, which I'm not going to do. If you're looking at the website on a mobile device instructions here, and, and why I mention that, because this is a long page, I've already scrolled down a good bit. There's more, and there are more pages here, too. So here's the weekly schedule. But before I jump to that, let me just show you the weekly requirements and then the schedule will make more sense. So uh, each of the 10 weeks of the quarter, you attend two lectures. So that would generally be right, two times 10 is 20, but there are actually only 17 lectures. Why? Because Thanksgiving takes off one and the midterm and final are during the class time. So, and again, you must attend these lectures at Campbell Hall to receive course credit. If you decided to turn this into an online course and not attend, you would uh, take 20% off of your course grade as a consequence. Um, and you might think, well, why do I do that? Because if I just made it optional to show up, wouldn't people come anyhow? So two years ago, we did an experiment um, to see if this would work, it would work. And that is, as we were transitioning off of COVID, we had in-lecture classes were optional. You could come here and, and actually attend the lecture, or you could just look at the material online. The first day of class, this class two years ago, we actually checked 85% of the class showed up. By the end of the term, it was about 20%. Literally, the room was empty because without a requirement, people just didn't bother to come. So, if you if you think that even that the you know the administration at UCSB is being outrageous and requiring us to do this, if we didn't do it, I think there would be a problem. A day or two after the lectures have been delivered, they're going to be uploaded to both YouTube and Gaucho Cast. So. Back there in the booth, they're recording us, and those videos will go up to Gaucho and Cast. And on the computer here itself, I'm recording them, and those will go up to YouTube. Um, and the YouTube ones, and I'll show you in a moment, can be streamed directly from this website. You have to go to the access schedule, uh, the weekly schedule above. Um, and if you, you know, if you miss class or something. Okay, you'll, if you don't have a reason for missing class, it's a problem, you'll lose that percentage. But even so, um, you need to go ahead and review this material so you're prepared for the exams. Um, and you know, if you're home quarantined or something like that. So every uh, week, there's a corresponding reading. They're listed on the web page, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and it's up to you. And I, so I've taught this course in one form or another since I arrived at UCSC, which was UCSB, which is back in 2006. So I've been debating with this particular issue among others ever since. Some people feel that they prefer to do the reading after they hear my lecture. Why would you do that? Well, I'm going to talk about the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's our first reading. I'm going to read the first portion of that uh, epic. Um, if you read it cold, you may not see a lot of environmental significance there. The environmental significance are what I'm going to unpack during the lecture. So if you read it first, you might be like, why are we even reading this? And then after the lecture, hopefully you'll say, ah, that's why we're reading it. So you could flip it around and hear what I have to say first, which will kind of prepare you for reading it. But it's really up to you. You'll have sufficient time either way to read it before or after lecture, before the exams, the midterm or final. I'm just letting you know it's up to you. Um, the main reader you have is um, comes from SB Printer, which is over in the U Senate if you're new to campus. There is an online link here that um, they'll deliver to you. The cost should be $34. There should be a copy or two or more placed in the library. If you pick it up at the U Senate, but if not, they will ship it to you. And I forget, I think it's like five bucks to have it shipped to you. 
there is not a digital version, just to be clear. There, the um, SB printer did digital versions during the pandemic, but it was kind of a mess for a lot of reasons. So they've discontinued that. So that's what you need right now. And you need that for next Tuesday. So the lecture covering that material is next Tuesday. If you want to read it in advance, you need it before then. If you want to read it after, I would get it then. Um, you need another book. Second book you have to buy is Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. I know, I think this link I made to Amazon, like 15 bucks, Kindle editions, like 12 bucks. You can get an audible version as well. People tell me that if you search for Silent Spring PDF in your browser, that you can find a free online PDF. I have no reason to, I don't know if that's true. It may not be legal. I don't want you to download anything that's not legal. I'm just telling you what people tell me. I can't endorse it because I don't know if it's okay to do, but that's what I hear. But even so, I note down here below, I'll just jump to it. So you have 30, uh, what I say, $34 and say 15 if you bought it from Amazon is $49. And my goal was to bring the total cost of the textbooks under $50. So we did it. You will need a third book which you're reading from, Walden or Life in the Woods by Henry David Thoreau. But I've created an online version of it with a preface and introduction. I'll explain all that when we get to it. And you can just click on that there. So you need to buy two books or buy one and download one you go. Um, so you got lectures, you have um, readings you have to do. Every week you'll be watching a film. You won't be watching it here. It used to be back in the day before we had Gaucho Cast that this class was actually three days a week. It was Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and Friday was film day where we showed the documentaries in class. Now, through technology, we have Gaucho Cast, which is powered by Panopto, so you can watch whenever you want online. If you go to Canvas, links to it, I've already uploaded them all. I'm gonna show you in the weekly schedule what you have for this week. So you have to watch those documentaries one per week. And um, I note, and I'll show you, that I've created a little introductory talk for each of the week's film. It's up on YouTube, and I'll show you where that is in a minute. That is only going to run five or seven minutes or so. And basically what it is is me giving you some introductory thoughts on the um, weekly film and some things to think about. But then I ask you to comment on that. And that's part of your grade assessment is 20% of the course grade comes from those comments. So if you follow that, and I'll talk about the assessment in a little bit, but you know, if you're watching 10 documentaries, you have to watch them and comment on them. And that's 2% of your grade for each one. Two times 10 is 20%. Um, you may find it more interesting to watch my little film first, contextualizing it. But let me go here to a week because this is all like overview stuff. And let's see if this opens okay. And it's going to be if it, yep. All right. Um, if everyone, if they would, stop accessing the, in, the English department website for a minute. Um, but let me talk about Wi-Fi and cellular connections in this room. It's an important issue. And that is, in this room, it's designed with Wi-Fi access points all around. And it's designed so that everyone in the room can actually um, access uh, it at the same time. That's the theory. In the past, we've had problems with that. And where this becomes an issue is when we do the actual polls in the class for the eye clicker. So when I ask an eye clicker question, everyone is simultaneously hitting that eye clicker at the same time, 860 people, and we've had trouble with it not working. They tell me that it is all upgraded and should be fine now, which is great. But a couple things you should know. Um, in fact, let's just do one right here while I'm doing this. Um, this is iClicker up here. I will be tell you when it, telling you when it happens. I'll hit poll and I will start this. And I'm telling you that I'm taking a poll. I'll put select and we'll do that. Notice there's a counter here, 125. 
the minute and 30 seconds, 90 seconds is what we have. If you want to respond to this now, 27 people, 31 people have, that's great. Uh, this doesn't count today. I'm not, um, you know, going to count that. I just want you to uh, to see how it works. It will officially be working next week. Uh, so if you have an eye clicker that's not working, if you have problems, if you don't understand it, not sure like how to do the eye clicker, Dina, who is here behind me, she's the one who's actually doing that. So we'll be handling that for us. So yeah. And again, if you'd stop hitting the English department website, that would be terrific. Let me just try this for, huh, let's try this. Okay, so um, again, you might want to just have check that to see if um, uh, okay. So again, stop hitting that English department website. Yeah, it's having trouble. Okay, not a worry. We have other stuff to talk about. So um, that's how the eye clicker will work. So just so you know, actually embedded in the lectures that we have, and you'll see if I get, if I can get back to the English department, um, it's on Prezi. There are actually three questions on the eye clicker every week. Those questions um, I will announce. There shouldn't be any confusion. You have 90 seconds to do it. If you have trouble getting on, and it's not it's not working. It's, we can suggest a couple things. First, they tell me that um, each year there can be a, uh, an issue when the new term starts in the fall. If you're having trouble and you can't get on to Wi-Fi and you're trying to get on the UCSB network, go into your settings on your uh, device, presumably your phone, and forget that network and then try to log on to it again. Because for whatever reading, your credentials, for whatever reason, your credentials aren't, uh, aren't working. And that's, that's the issue. So um, the other thing that you could do is to, uh, <laughs> we're gonna see what happens here. Um, the other thing that you could do, if the Wi-Fi isn't working at all, you could try switching to a cellular network. And that you would think then, well, why not just do that? I mean, why play around with the um, the Wi-Fi network if it's not working? Um, the problem with doing that is that if everyone hits the cellular network, we we know that there's a lot of redundancy built into the Wi-Fi. But if you're like on T-Mobile, we have no way of knowing if there's much redundancy built in that. So let's say a third of the people tried to hit the T-Mobile network. I'm pretty sure that would be a disaster. So. Yeah, that's an issue. Okay, um, since the English department website is not, so if everyone would please not hit that. If you have it open, please close that tab. Um, and we'll see if, the, if this actually um, works here. Um, by the way, you might be curious what this is. We're actually, ah, we're back there. But this one's still wonky. And um, if you're wondering how this is done here, um, this is basically a hack on using Zoom, and Zoom is what is recording me from this webcam, and Zoom is doing our um, actual. Hold on. Ah, how about that? Cool. Okay. Anyhow, um, so let me show you a week here. Since this week is not working, I will do. Oh, stop that. Um, okay. So we're going to go here. I told you about course films and all. Um, we're going to talk about grading and things like that. But first, let me show you an average page. This is week four. I wanted to do week number one, but um, it's not refreshing. So what will happen, week one is just like this. You go to week um, one or four or whatever, and here's the reading. So you go to the, uh, the reader that you got from SP Printer. There it is. I mentioned the lectures are here. 
And I talk about a Prezi. So let me show you the Prezi here, if this has popped up, because that should be Prezi. Yeah. This is the lecture notes for the course. I'll be going over this in detail on our next class, but I just wanted to show you. This is all the lecture notes for the class, or in this case, it's for the first nine lectures. They're actually, as I mentioned, 17. You might wonder why there aren't 17 here. And that's because it's, it's so much information that a, a normal browser tab won't can handle it. But I'll go over this in detail. But if you go down here to say Mesopotamia, this is our second lecture. This is all about Gilgamesh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And you can click on any area here and it gives you random access to the lecture. So note that, let me just go back to that a minute. This was number C here in lecture two. And note that there, C is in character Gilgamesh. There are basically slides here. There are eight of them and we click on one and the lectures will be basically me moving through this material. Why this is important is, and at any time if you want with the Prezi, you can go back to it. You may never want to access the Prezi. I will be lecturing from it and it's great to have the notes here, but, and it's great if you, you know, if you say you were preparing for the midterm and you remember there's something about a genus Loki thing in Gilgamesh. Well, you could go right here, genus Loki figures, and you could pop right in and see that material. But there's a better way, I think, for you to access this or to be doing it while you're taking uh, notes. And that is if you go here, and again, we'll see if the English department website is gonna help us. Ah, there it is. So what that does, and again, here we were, and uh, oh, which number one just popped up. How cool is that? Okay, now I can't get anywhere. Um, what I did for week four is I just hit the where it says lecture here. And for each class, there's a full set of lecture notes. So, um, and once this thing goes away from um, Zoom, I will be able to show you. Actually, can I just pull this down? Yeah. So here it is, lecture seven. And if you remember, uh, oh, that was lecture seven. But what would happen is, and we'll just pull this down below here. So let's go into lecture one here. And we hit the uh, link for here, open the new tab. Here's lecture one. As you recall, or might recall, I said that C was, uh, it's not the one I wanted. Hold on. I wanted to open lecture number two. Open link in new tab. Lecture one, we can close. Lecture two was open. If you remember, I said C was the character of Gilgamesh. Well, there is C. And if you remember, there were eight things. Here are all eight. So all the material that is on the lecture is on the PDF. Why that's important is you don't need to sit here and copy down what's on the slide. So if we're you know, actually doing the lecture, you don't have to, to worry about that because all that material is already up there for you. So will this palette move? Oh, how about that? All right, this is gonna work so much better now. Okay, so what you can do then is just go ahead and the lectures will be simpler because I'm not moving have all these parts. You don't have to write down anything that's on the screen at all. In fact, you notice the way I uh, structured these PDFs, there's a lot of white space on here. So how would you do this? Yeah, one of two ways, I guess. If you want to go old school, you could print it out, have the physical paper here, bring it in during the lecture and write notes on it, or just get a PDF editor of some sort, um, whether you're on a computer or um, uh, tablet or, or phone actually it works quite well. So anyhow, that's how the lectures work. So do the reading, come to lecture. One way or another, I would, I would have access to the lecture notes. I will be presenting from the Prezi, but you don't have to worry about the Prezi. Now, this is very confusing. Uh, the below lectures are not the lectures for the, this year, 2022-24. So let me just um, open one of these and see if it'll play.
these lectures are from last year. If you notice, it kind of looks like, like what's happening this year. It was pre-recorded. That's me talking. So um, why am I doing it this way? Well, you're not watching a pre-recorded lecture. You're watching me actually talking the whole time. So the notion is that those lectures from last, so why, why did I leave the lectures up? I guess that's the real question. If it's so confusing, why don't I just take them all down before the term started and put new lectures up? Well, again, people access this material all over the place and they may want to access those lectures. So, but what will happen is as soon as the new lectures are up, in fact, there's actually lecture zero, which is this one, and that will be up shortly. By the end of the week on this website, where it says the existing one is now, the new one will be up. After, after every lecture, the day or two later, the, you know, the older ones, which if we go down here or like here, they will be replaced. How you will know the difference, see where it says Eco Criticism 101, lecture two. Parenthetically, I intend to make all the new ones say uh, 2023. So know that these are old ones, do not get confused. I will also be taking down this little uh, disclaimer once I get the new ones up. So all this may not matter to you though. So everything I just said may not matter and why? Well, you come to lecture, you pay attention to lecture, maybe you download the PDF. You won't need to access the, the video. You don't need to access the Prezi, but if you want them, they're available and they could come in handy. You know, if you're quarantining or something in the middle of the term, you may be very happy that all this material is up there. So this is a typical page. This is again, week number one, which I finally got to open. So this is what you'll be reading this week. You'll be reading the uh, Myth of Gilgamesh and the Forest Journey. They're both in the course reader. I put a trigger warning. There is a uh, brief but disturbing reference to rape in the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh. So. Um, I wanted you to know that. Here are the lectures. You're also going to watch a film every week. Most of them are documentaries, not all. So this week, you're going to watch either Before the Flood or an Inconvenient Sequel. Um, why are, are there these two? What's up with that? Um, why isn't everyone watching the same thing? Well, these 10 documentaries, I think, are kind of like the 10 most important environmental films right now that I would have you watch. And I want as many people to see them as possible. So the other class I teach after this English 23, it's the same way. And you can, if you haven't watched one, watch the other. So how does this work in practice? Well, one film I think very important, you may have seen it already, is Cowspiracy. Um, Cowspiracy is a good film and it's all about the carbon footprint of the meat industry, principally beef industry. Um, if you just take one course with me, like this one, it'll say that'll be the first course, you should watch it. But if you've taken the second course, there's an alternate film. And that week, the film is wasted. And you may have seen that, but probably not. It's not nearly as popular as Cowspiracy. Cowspiracy talks about the problem with um, eating meat. So in other words, if the whole planet shifted to a largely plant-based diet, it would be phenomenal for the environment for the climate especially. Waste, it talks about the fact that we waste a lot of food. And here's a little tidbit that you may not know. You may know that eating a larger plant-based diet is great for the climate. Actually, wasting less food is better for the, for the uh, climate. It's a bigger issue. If every, and across the planet, depending on the country, depending on the economic level of individuals and all, um, we waste between a third and half of all food that we produce. It's a huge problem, especially since much of it goes into landfills where, where it's converted into methane and is a much bigger problem. And incidentally, just a little tidbit here, if you ever wanted to know what the biggest climate problem is right now, in other words, if we could just change one thing, what would it be? Well, you might think the answer would be renewable energy, replace as much uh, fossil fuel-based power plants as we can with, say, solar, 
or replace them with wind or shift to electric cars and all. Yeah, those are all good and I, I wouldn't put down any of them. But the number one thing that we can do, which is bigger than solar, bigger than wind, bigger than electric cars, is stop wasting as much food. The number two thing that we can do, again, bigger than wind, solar, or electric cars, is to um, eat a large plant-based diet across the planet. Those are bigger than anything. And my particular perspective, because I come at this from the perspective of the humanities, I'm less interested in technological solutions, although I certainly applaud them, than the kind of cultural changes like that. And the fascinating thing is most people do not know that the number one biggest problem is food waste. And people think something like electric cars are good. If you look at people who actually chart this, like Project Drawdown, which we look at in English 23, you'll learn that on a list of 25 things, wasted food is number one, plant-based is number two, electric cars aren't even on the top 25. So it's interesting. Anyhow, I think I've just digressed a little. So you either, either watch one film or another, probably most of you will watch Before the Flood. It streams from Gaucho cast. If you haven't, then you'll watch an inconvenient sequel, which is by Al Gore. It's a sequel to his um, blockbuster documentary, the number 11 documentary in history, as far as uh, people have watched it, which is an inconvenient truth. So what to do after that is watch my little lecture, Intro to Before the Flood and an Inconvenient Sequel on YouTube. And to make life easy for you, I have that posted here. So this is, we'll see how long this is. Yeah, six minutes long. And they all start the same way. And this is me talking, talking. And by the way, um, UCSB students, there were a little team of them that helped do all the editing for these. So they should be pretty nice um, videos. But I introduced the topic. And if you go to YouTube to watch those, that's where you make the comment. In other words, um, watching them here is fine. We're streaming here, but you can't comment. You can't make a YouTube comment from here. You have to do that from YouTube itself. So. If you've been following what I just said, the main action for this class is not on Canvas. Canvas doesn't have much. It's on this website. And in fact, we're gonna go back to that, that landing page, which has a lot of things like grade breakdown, which I'll do next. But weekly, this is what you need to do. You need to come here, figure out what the readings are. You need to figure out what the film is you have to watch. And if you wanna use like the Prezi or something, you can. So if people have questions on any of this, let me know. And um, I'm saying that as I'm waiting for um, this to populate. And oh, we have a new question. Um, the link to the eye clicker isn't working. That's going to be fixed, right? We have to, we have to, we have to put a link to you too. We will put a new link in Canvas soon. So don't worry, that'll get resolved by the time that we uh, actually have lecture next Tuesday. Okay, but again, if you have questions. Anyhow, so scrolling down, I'm back on the main page again. So I mentioned some of this already. Attendance is 20% of the course grade, and we only have 17 lectures. So it's worth a little more than a point per time you miss a class. It's taken by way of uh, iClicker. It's taken relatively randomly. But the good news for you is this. The average lecture has three iClicker polls. So you're here for an hour and 15 minutes. Um, you have to answer two of the three. It doesn't matter what the answer you give, because I'll ask things like, you know, you believe that the climate crisis is a big problem. I don't care if you say it's not. Um, but I am curious about what people think, but we don't look at individual answers, but we do look at the fact that people are actually here and using the eye clicker for attendance. I'm gonna ask three questions. You have to answer two of the three to get full credit. So if you get here a little late, if you're running or something, that's fine, you'll be okay. You might have missed the first question. Um, but again, that's not licensed to say that you can come in 20 minutes late every time. And it's not licensed to say you can leave 20 minutes early every time. And there will be people, by the way, after the second question, I'll do it. I'll close the eye clicker poll and I'll see people turn around and leave the room. Um, I don't know what I could do to that. I mean, the answer would be require you to answer all three, but it doesn't seem fair that people legitimately have a problem. They're you know, running slow from the class or something. So that's how it will work. Midterm, Campbell Hall during a regular class period, 
please save that date. And the midterm covers obviously the first five weeks of the course. So that is the end of week five. And um, there will be no reading assignment that week. And the final exam will be not during exam week, but the very last day of class, which is 10 weeks from now on a 10 weeks, 11 weeks from now on a Thursday. Save that data too. A couple things you want to know. Each exam is worth 30% of the grade. So if you remember what I just said, attendance is 20%. Well, midterm is 30%, final is 30%. 20, 20, 30, and 30 is 80 plus 20% for comments, which I talked about before, but I'll get to it in a minute. So common details you wanna know, each one's worth 30% of the grade, 60% for two. These are multiple choice exams. Each has 60 questions. So again, if the exam is worth 30% of the grade, each question is worth one half percent of the total grade. They're all multiple choice and you generally you're going to have selection of five answers. So, um, each exam is 75 minutes long, unless you have DSP accommodations. So if you have DSP accommodations, you'll be taking this in a separate room with a separate proctor. And that will be how that works. They'll be paper-based. They will be, um, a company called GradeScope produces them. It's basically like Scantron or something. You've done all these before. You fill in the little bubble for answer A or B or whatever. It's not open book. There are going to be four separate versions of the exams, um, and each version will have the questions in a different order. So, in other words, if you're tempted to look at the person sitting next to you, you're both, you know, looking, you can see you're working on question 30 and you see their question 30. Don't copy their answer because their question 30 will be different from yours. They will all be collated, they will all be different. Um, you're going to be asked questions on the readings and the lectures. But to be clear, you're also going to have questions on the documentaries and also those short little introductions that I put up on YouTube. All that could be on there. Talking to your neighbors not allowed. Um, no devices allowed. So let me just talk about this for a moment. Um, it is a huge pain that every year people try to uh, commit acts of academic dishonesty with the exams. And people often assume, um, I've had people in the past uh, assume that um, there's no way for us to prove that. So let me just take a minute to explain how this works kind of mathematically, statistically. You may find it interesting. Uh, you may be thinking twice about trying to do something like that. First, um, I am have a little webcam on top of here. Uh, during exams, We'll be making a recording full size. The webcam will be turned around so we can see everyone in the room. So if it's a question of two people talking, that'll all be recorded. But with this type of exam, there's a second way that that um, can be proven. So how that works is there'll be four of us generally, myself, the three TAs walking. The two TAs will be up front here. And, and by the way, I can see everyone in the room. The TAs can see everyone in the room. If two people look like they're collaborating, what happens is when they turn in their papers, each turns into bubble sheet, they may do it separately. The TA will set those two bubble sheets aside. Then Gradescope software will take over. So for example, what if both of you got the same question wrong, number 30? What's the chance of that happening? It's more like one in 60. It's a little less because statistically, not everyone will get everything wrong. Say it's one in 50. That doesn't mean anything in its own right because the answer, correct answer could be A and you wrote B and your neighbor put C. That doesn't prove anything because you're obviously not sharing answers. But what are the chances of the two of you both selecting the wrong answer? If it happens one time, statistically, it could be an anomaly. But we've had in the past where the software looked at it, and as a recent example comes to mind, where of the 60 questions, 15 of the questions that these two people had were wrong, and they each chose the same wrong answer. So if you want to do the math on that, how possible is that? I mean, if you're one in 50 and then there are three, five different answers, that's one in 300, but then if you do it by 15. And this is not 
handled by me. This gets turned into UCSB's Office of Academic Dishonesty. What I do from my point of view is immediately fail anyone uh, that's caught doing that. So you fail the course. That may be the least of your problems, depending on how egregious the, um, the problem is as far as dishonesty. And if you have any sort of record, because they will immediately you know, start a file when you involved. So I don't mean it to sound scary, but don't cheat, okay? I mean, it's it's just, it's it, it, it's so much paperwork that I had to deal with, nothing else. So, course films, 20% of the course grade, 10 films each or 2% of the course grade. I showed you that, you uh, count commenting on YouTube, it's a YouTube channel, you go criticism 101. Um, so the links for the comments, um, become, well, you can make the comment any time you want, but you have to make the comment by the following Monday. So there's actually, if you go to, let's see here, um, please note that your YouTube comments can short video on this needs to be completed by 6 a.m. on Monday, October 9th. So next week is October, if you didn't know. You'll be watching, you have all week to watch that documentary, all next week, all next weekend to watch it. But then, I used to say by midnight Sunday night, but I know a lot of people work late on midnight. So if you can stay up to as late as you want, even 6 a.m. and make a comment, and that will be on time. That's what you need to do. Um, also, some of the videos that you'll be watching will not be on GaucoCast, they actually will be on YouTube as they stream from there. Don't comment on their videos, comment on my video. So these, a few rules here, please note these because people forget them for some reason. Six of your comments, so out of the first five, three of the five, first five comments should be a comment made to another student. So in other words, you're gonna do five comments for the first five films. Two of them, you can just, you have a comment, just make it, that's fine. But for three of them, I want you to find someone else in the class and comment on their comments. So this is a way of kind of getting you um, talking back and forth. Honestly, I think it's less of a way of getting you talking back and forth, but more reading what other people are saying, because you may read, you know, Leonardo, you may watch Leonardo DiCaprio's Before the Flood, you may have very definite opinions, but you'll start reading and you'll see other people have all sorts of opinions on it. So I want you to um, sort of a little cross pollination to do that reading. Make sure you do that because every term somebody will come, more than one person will come and panic at the end of the first five videos and say that they weren't doing that. So please do that. Getting graded on your comments. I put this in red because it's important. As you make your weekly comment, in other words, as you make your weekly post to YouTube, please cut and paste each of them into a single text file on your computer. In other words, cut and paste them into a Microsoft Word file or Google Doc, whatever you want to use, but save them outside of YouTube. Um, and first off, if you don't do this, you're going to have to go back and find them on YouTube, which could kind of be a pain. But second, some people have said that their comments have gone away on YouTube. I don't make them go away, but I don't know how their algorithms work and apparently it has happened. So you would be kind of screwed then, but if you've saved it, it doesn't matter because all that we care about is not, when the TAs are not gonna to go to YouTube and look for every comment, they want you to upload that text file at the end of the, um, the section. So what will happen by 6 a.m. on Monday, November 6th, you'll upload your first five comments to Canvas. You'll upload it not from YouTube, but from that document that you've saved to, let's say, Google Docs or something. Um, and it's very easy to do. The link is not up yet on Canvas because we're a month away from that, obviously. But it will be there, and that's how you will do it. So you'll save yourself a lot of trouble, a lot of aggravation. I mean, people have panicked, you know, sent me panicked emails that they couldn't find their comments and, you know, they went away, what should they do? And the only thing I can ask them to do, and this is kind of being kind, is to let them completely make a new comment. But it's so much easier to save your comments as you go and you'll have them there. Um, when we get to it, these are instructions on how to upload them to Canvas, but um, you don't really need to worry about that now. There is an honors section 
here that meets every Thursday right before class from 10 to 10.50 in South Hall. Um, if you want to be there, um, email me to tell me. It is a very small honor section. So there are 860 people in the class. There are only 15 people in the honor section. So when you email me, if you're interested, give me your reason for wanting to join the class because I will most likely get more than 15 and I have to kind of decide and I will decide based on the email with the reason she won. So I'm not gonna prompt you to tell you what you write, but um, yeah. But um, if you do, do that and do it before midnight on October 1st. So I have time to uh, send you ad codes and all. So the TAs and I will primarily be communicating with you through the instructor's announcements on um, Canvas. So if you go to Canvas and you look there, you'll already see that the first one is up. That was the comment I sent out yesterday. But if there's anything important coming up, that's where it'll be. So one of the first things you wanna check. And we will send out reminders. So if you notice there are like important dates I just gave you, like when the midterm is gonna be. Well, I will be announcing during lecture when the midterm is going to be. And it'll also be an announcement, most likely instructor's announcement. There'll be an announcement that you need to get your comments uploaded and things like that. Um, but also check that course TA. Uh, of course, I'm sorry, uh, of course, Q&A. Um, yeah, so I said this already, but the course material is primarily located here on this website rather than Canvas. And the reason is, um, as I note here, I, I think this kind of material should be open to the public. I think anyone should have access to it. Um, I think it's great to have this kind of material out there so I can see what other professors are doing, they can see what I do. Most people don't do it this way and it, it, it is vexing as far as I'm concerned, but there you have it. Um, at the end of every term, people come to me saying, oh, you know, I have an 89.2, can I get extra credit? Is there anything I can do to get an A in the class? And the answer is no, unfortunately, because the class is just too large. It's not like we could give everyone the option of writing a paper, just grading them and keeping track of them would be too difficult. So I can tell you a few things right off the bat, though, thinking about your grade already. These are actually very helpful. Um, come to class. Um, the saddest thing is when I see people missing like five classes, which works out to like 6% of their course grade, and a person who gets like an 85 in the class could have had, which would be a straight B, not a B plus, but a B, that person could have gotten a 91 and an A minus. So the, the easiest thing to do is to come to class. It doesn't require any effort other than coming to class. The other thing that you should definitely not miss doing are to make your weekly comments. Because I can tell you right now, the TAs, as long as it's a thoughtful comment, as long as you haven't copied it from someone, but they will give you pretty much most of the credit, if not all the credit for your comment, if you write a thoughtful comment. You could disagree with my position or whatever, but if you write a thoughtful comment. So if you do that, then first off, you got 20% of the grade um, for just coming to class and you get another 20% for doing the comments. That's gonna help you. And it's gonna help because the exams can be kind of tough. And just to clarify with that, um, some people, um, do very well in this class. So there will be, who's talking? What are you talking? So could you be quiet in the back there? Could you be quiet? We can hear you. Um, sorry, there are people at the door. Um, that's something I want to note about this room now. So this room, uh, Kemba Hall, is where all the arts and lectures performances on campus mostly happen. Some of them happen downtown um, at the Granada Theater, but the acoustics in this room are very good. And it happens one day, I was projecting something on film and I was walking around the room and I was over there and there were three people on that side of the room talking and I could actually understand their conversation because of the acoustics of the room. So that's why it's important not to, to, um, to, to talk in the class here. Um, but there's no extra credit, but again, 40% of the grade attendance and comments, it's easy to get. The exams are tough, but I will tell you that dozens of people traditionally in this class actually get an A plus for the course. Um, because if you do well in the exams and you get those 
uh, points, it's very easy to, to do. But you do need to carefully read the material, look over the material. And I say that, and I'll actually give you an example of why that's important. So the films all stream from GauchoCast, or most of them do. GauchoCast has something called GauchoCast Analytics. If you're familiar with YouTube, it's like YouTube Analytics. But I can actually look and see how much of a film a person has watched. I don't do that. I mean, not as a matter of course, the grade's not based on it or anything. But a couple of years ago, I did a little experiment. I looked at everyone who got, or maybe a dozen people who got an A plus in the class, and I looked at their watching behavior. Every one of those people watched at least 100% of the documentary. Most of them watched more. So what was that about? Well, they watched the whole documentary probably, they came back and they reviewed it for the exam. Those people got an A plus in the course. I then looked randomly at people who weren't watching much of the film, and I could see that. So they were watching like 18 minutes of the film, and and people did that. They watched like 18 minutes, they got bored, they stopped watching, and that was it. Every one of those person, every one of those people, got below a C in the class. So the exams are not tough. If you do the material, if you read the material, you watch the material, you should be fine. But for people who don't, those are people are going to have trouble. Um, it's really loud out there, isn't it? So here's the grading. Um, there is not flexibility. So again, people ask if I'll just randomly raise their grade. No. Um, you may know this, but if you're curious, this is the UCSP grading scale on how it works here. You can check into that. Um, I know better to post your questions in the Q&A. Um, if there's anything personal, of course, don't put it in the Q&A. Just, you know, um, email your TA. The website, by the way, looks this way with large print and all one because it projects well on screen, but also for people with different sorts of disabilities. Um, so we have six minutes left and people are closing up, standing up. So um, I'll just, just give me another two or three minutes. Um, I mentioned already about the documentaries. And by the way, it's usually the case the lectures are going to go full time. So um, seriously, if you, if you can't do that, you should... Uh, Think about it. Yeah, yeah, now we have to have questions about AI and all. Um, it's silly to use AI to do a comment. And by the way, that's the new thing, but there were always things people did. So if you look, the YouTube, com YouTube videos I have up are from a couple of years ago. There are already thousands of comments. So people would be think they're clever, they'd read two or three comments, they'd aggregate them together, put it in their own words, like, People said Leonardo, they didn't like that Leonardo DiCaprio was the spokesperson because he's this wealthy person. Many people said that. So a person would not watch the film, read those comments, and then say something of the sort. That's not a good idea because you're going to be tested on those videos. So if you think you can, you know, scam the 